Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when Jesus started his mission, when he started his public life, the very first sentence he uttered was this. This is like a summary of the whole Christian revelation. Oh, this is like the summary of the real foundation of Christianity. According to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 1, verse 15, he said, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believed in the gospel. How are we going to understand? The time is fulfilled. The Greek word used there for time is kairos. There are two Greek words for time, actually. One is chronos. Chronos means the clock time. For an example, uh, if you check your watches now, maybe it's, for an example, maybe 1.15 or 7.30 or 7.55. It depends. You see, that's chronological time. The clock time is the uh, chron chronos means the chronological time or the clock time. That is not the word used by Christ here. He is using kairos. Kairos means, in Greek, decisive time. You have to make a decision. That, can, that, is, that also has the connotation of being a crisis time, meaning to say you need to respond. You cannot escape from the challenge. It's a matter between death and life. If you don't make a decision, you are going to miss that opportunity. You had the opportunity, you miss it. Why? You did not make a decision. You simply neglected the opportunity. You simply skip the uh, challenge, from the challenge. So he's using that word kairos. The time is fulfilled. It has arrived. And that time with the audience of Jesus was his own time, that, that moment. When he was addressing his, his audience, when he was addressing his Jewish people at that moment in Capernaum, that was their kairos. That means they had to respond to Jesus at that moment. With some other people, it changed. It, it varies. For an example, if you take uh, St. Paul, it came only later. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, Paul came to know Jesus and then he responded to his kairos. And after that, of course, we have, for an example, St. Augustine. When he was in his 30s, he responded. That was his kairos. That was his uh, decisive moment. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi in his uh, uh, mid-20s, something like that, you see, he responded. So kairos comes to different people at different times. So maybe for you, the kairos is now at this moment. This moment you are listening to me. Now is the time you need to begin to change your life. Especially if there are things you have neglected very much, you have not paid attention to, or you did not want to change because they were so painful. Change does not come easily. You see, one of the fears we have is the fear to change our lives. But this could be your kairos. For another person, kairos will be tomorrow morning, or next week, or next month. But for us, those who are participating in this uh, discussion, you could take your kairos as this moment. If there are certain things you need to change, don't postpone. Do not procrastinate. Do it now. Because we do not know whether we are going to die tonight or whether we would die tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening. Therefore, do not postpone. You're going to regret it. You're going to have mighty regrets about it. That's what Jesus is saying. This is the moment. This is the, um, now is the moment of wisdom. If you miss that moment, you may not have that moment again. You are not going to have most likely that moment again because we may not live that long. So we have to live 
as if each moment is a crisis moment. Each moment is a kairos moment. As if each moment is a decisive moment. Then, say for an example, you have been living your life uh, in such a manner that you had been expecting Christ at any moment. So you did justice to your life. You did your very best. You had a full life. You had a very meaningful life. Now, when you look back at your life after living in such a manner, when you look back at your life so far, the life you have lived so far, you are not going to have any regrets about life. That's the good thing about it. Why? Because you have done your very best. You have lived to the fullest. You have helped other people out to the best of your capacity. You had a very generous, very compassionate, very loving life. No regret when you look back at your life. Therefore, you are not afraid to die any moment. If death comes after two minutes from now, you are not afraid. You are ready. If death comes to you next tomorrow morning, you would be ready. No problem. If it comes to you uh, two weeks from now, no problem. You are ready because when you look back at your life, there are no regrets about your life whatsoever. So to live our life, to do justice to our life, is, this is the only way. To treat each moment as a decisive moment. So that's what he's saying. The time is fulfilled. Don't postpone living. Not only that, he's saying repent. Change your lifestyle. You see the word repent, and repent uh, in Greek, the noun is metanoia. The, ver the verb is metanoite. Be repenting or repent. Meaning to say, not only the lifestyle, it has also the connotation of changing your mentality, changing your perspective. Two words, meta mean beyond in Greek. Nous mean the mind, your mind set up, the way you think about other people, the way you look at the world the way you think about God, the way you think about yourself, all could be wrong, all could be very narrow, or one-sided, or partial. Change them. Undergo deep trans transformation. Get rid of your biases, your prejudices, your prejudgments, your narrow conclusions, your wrong conclusions. Sometimes you are, you know, preconceived ideas etc. Have a fresh mind. Have a kind of a mind that undergoes healing constantly. Because sometimes this is very important to understand uh, this aspect about repentance because sometimes we would commit the same, same sin, sin again and again because we, do, we have not undergone deep transformation. Sometimes some people have the habit of uh, you know, committing the same mistake and confessing it, they would go to a priest and confess and again committing the same uh, sin after a month or two and doing the same thing. Why is it happening? Why can we not overcome that tendency? The reason is very simple because there is no change in our mind. Even though we went to confession, we have not changed our mentality, our mind, our perspective. We are still the same person, same old person. We still have the same old mentality, the same old mindset. Then, if you have the same mentality naturally, unavoidably, you would be committing the same mistakes. That's natural. Because you are the same person. You are the same old person. Then you would be doing the same old things. That follows logically. When you have a new mind, a new perspective, when you have a transformed heart, you would not be doing the same thing. You would not be doing all things. You would be doing new things. New things mean holy things. So you would then, you, it would be easy for you to move away from your dark past, that sinful past, and start a new life. That's why repentance is very important. Repentance is also 
the foundation of a new life actually. No repentance, no change of heart, no change of mind. You cannot begin a new life. And also repentance means, if you analyze it in a very simple, very practical manner, repentance also means you begin to love yourself. You say goodbye to your destructive lifestyle. Repentance means actually beginning to love yourself. How come it becomes uh, like that? You know, the reason is this. If you had been, let's say, uh, been a victim of some addictions or some sort of a, you know, some destructive uh, behavioral pattern, when you realize it, not only when you realize it, but you may, when you make a decision to change your destructive patterns of behavior and your sinful lifestyle, you are doing justice to your life, the God-given life. Life had been given to you as a gift from God. And when you sin, you are destroying that life. Sin is self-destructive. Sin destroys life. So then you say goodbye to that addiction. It can be drug addiction or alcoholism or whatever it could be. You say, I will no longer follow this lifestyle. Then you have already begun to love yourself. Why? You are not following that destructive lifestyle, that destructive path, that sinful path. Therefore, now, for the first time in your life, you are beginning, you have begun to do justice to the life God gave you. So repentance means concretely then you have begun to love yourself the way God loves you. Not only that, when you begin to love yourself, it would be very easy for you to love others also. Now you come home with your right mind. You are no longer drunk or you are no longer high uh, with drugs, then even your family members will welcome you, your children, your wife and others. They are very happy about your change because you are in your right mind now. You come, with real, uh, you come home with compassion, uh, with concern and with intimacy for your family members, you see. When you undergo change, other people will also become happy. When you begin to love yourself, it would be very easy for you to love others. Even though verbally you may say, I love your fam my family, etc., but your action may not show it. Right? Your lifestyle may contradict you. So when you begin to love yourself truly, you could also love others very easily. Not only that, then you also begin to love God because you, you treasure the life he gave you. You are doing justice to the life God gave you. Now, repentance means beginning to love oneself and beginning to do justice to one life. When you begin to love yourself, you could also love others and serve others. Before, you were a burden unto other people when you were following that sinful path. You were a burden, you were a curse, but now you have become a blessing. You see, people will get inspired by you. Not only that, other people also who were following a similar path or who were also trapped in similar addictions, now could take you as an example, as a role model. They could get energy and inspiration and determination to change their lifestyles also and to begin to live a holy life like you. You see, when we repent, a lot of good things would begin to happen, not only to us, but also to the whole society. So that's why he's emphasizing the aspect of repentance, the foundation of Christianity. If we do many other things without repenting, it's useless. We don't have the solid foundation. And also he said in, in that uh, uh, sentence, again, uh, let's follow what he said. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, and repent and believe in the gospel. So the kingdom of God 
is a reality we could also experience now. Of course, not the totality of it. We don't have to wait until we die, or we don't have to wait until tomorrow or next week. Kingdom of we could also have a foretaste of the kingdom of God here and now. So that's very clear. You know, he's saying the time is fulfilled. So it has already arrived. So we have to respond to it. The problem is never the delaying of the kingdom of God. No. God is working all, all the time. He's there. He's in our midst. But the problem is we don't respond to the kingdom of God now and here. We keep postponing it. Therefore, we become unhappy. We cannot see any improvement in the world. We think, you know, it's something uh, that would happen in the future, not during our lifetime. No. It's also happening now with science. We could have a foretaste of it. We could live our life as if we are already in it. You see, Jesus came to make us happy now, not in the future, not after our death. Of course, even after our death, we are going to be happy. Had you lived your life in Christ. But Christ is capable of making you happy even now. That's why he came. If not, what's, what's the point of his coming? You know? So he's not like a politician making future promises. No. In the future, we will do like this. We will do these things. No. He's making promises now. Here and now, we could experience now. We don't need to postpone the real happiness of life. Christ could make us happy even now. So, for an example, let's take an example. There is a young man. He thinks, I will, be, I will become happy if I get married. Or he thinks, <clears throat> or he would think, I will be happy if I get a job. <clears throat> I will be happy if I get a promotion. I will be happy if I have my own house or if I could get my own car, etc. That's fine. We need these things. Life needs these things. But Christ is capable of making you happy even before you have a job, even before you have a car, even before you have a promotion, even before you get married, or even before you have whatever, whatever is necessary for your happiness, you see. You don't have to wait until you receive these things. Even before you receive these things, he can make you happy. And when you receive these things, it will add to your happiness. You will be happier. You will become happier. But these things alone will not make you happy. And if you think like that, you are absolutely mistaken. You are following an illusory path. Christ could make you happy even if you don't have a job yet. Christ could make you happy even if you are not married yet. Christ could make you happy even if you don't have your own house or your own car. He could make you happy even if you don't have received your promotion. Those things are necessary. These material, mundane things are necessary. But they are not absolute. They are relative. We need these things to go through life. But these things will not make you happy. It's Christ who will make you happy no matter what, under what condition you are living. Let's say you are suffering from a sickness. You see, even while you are suffering from a sickness, he could give you some inner peace, some inner assurance. He could give you real consolation. So even before you get cured, you are happy. Once you get cured of your disease, you will be happier. So you see, the cure will provide you with greater happiness. But that alone will not make you happy. Under all circumstances, in other words, Christ could make you happy. It does not matter the situation you are facing in life. It does not matter the crisis you are undergoing, the difficulties you are facing, or the confusions you are undergoing and facing. Christ is capable of making you happy under all the circumstances. That's why he, that's why he is our Savior. 
So his happiness, the happiness he is going to give us is unconditional. That happiness does not depend on any outside factor, any mundane factor or any mundane situation. No matter what, what is happening in the world, of course we need to work for their transformation. But he could give you the deep consolation all of us are longing for. In fact, true consolation in life comes from faith in God. So faith in God gives us the true and the real and the lasting consolation. Other consolations are temporary. They come and go. They are not, uh, they are not real. They are not enduring. So that is why he's saying the kingdom of God has arrived. The kingdom of God is at hand. We don't need to postpone happiness. We don't need to postpone a sense of fulfillment in life. We don't need to postpone uh, to find a proper direction for our life. And also finally he said, believe in the gospel or believe in the good news. Meaning to say, life has a greater purpose. God has a plan for us. Good news means that. Good news means, of course, it has many valid meanings. Uh, among those meanings, one is very important, which is God in good news, God is inviting us to look at life, look at the world, and look at other people from his perspective. Good news means the perspective of God. God's news. God's enlightenment. He's inviting us to look at the world, look at our life from this perspective. Then we acquire a very broad, if not the broadest perspective about life. Then you begin to see things you did not before. You begin to become marvel about your own power, like loving one's enemies. Before you thought, that you are not capable of loving your enemies. Before you may have thought that you are not capable of forgiving some people. But you know now, not only you know, you have uh, experienced that power of forgiveness and loving one's enemies. You see, without the good news, you may not have recognized those powers. Good news means, you know, God is raising you to a high level of existence. High, high, high level of living your life. You are not now living your life not according to your feelings and emotions and sentiments. No. Good news means you are living your life according to a value system. That value system is the value system of Christ. The gospel values. That means you have patterned your life not according to your whims and your urges but according to a high, according to some high value system. So before you wanted to revenge your enemies, now you want to forgive. Before you wanted to kind of do a tit for tat thing, but now you are capable of forgiving them. You see, believing in good news means, in other words, you become very capable of doing a lot of things. You develop a lot of potentialities you had no idea you possessed before. You become gigantic. You become a great person. You become a someone who is capable of doing a lot of things. You become like a god, actually. God with a simple G. You become really like, like uh, Christ says in the Gospel of John, you know, you are like God now because you are capable of doing a lot of things. Your full potential becomes a reality only when you believe in the good news. Because then God had made you bigger than who you were. Bigger than what you thought you are capable of accomplishing. That's why without a good news, without some great ideals, without a gigantic vision about life, life becomes a tiny little project, a boring project, a meaningless, if not a useless passion it becomes. 
God created us for greater things, bigger things, not for our personal glory, but for the glory of God and for the benefit of other people and for the benefit of the whole universe. So believing in the gospel is very important because the more you believe in the gospel, the greater your potential becomes. And the more you believe in the gospel, the greater your self-confident becomes. That's why this is really, really necessary for our life. So again, let us remind ourselves the foundation of his message, the very first words he uttered, what are they? The time is fulfilled. That time is now, here and now. Not tomorrow, uh, next day, or next month. Now. And the kingdom of God is at hand. It has already arrived. We need to respond to it now, today. Repent. How are you going to uh, respond? By changing our lifestyle. By changing our mentality. By changing our perspective about life. Especially our narrow perspectives our narrow ideas, our narrow mentalities. So repent and believe in the gospel. You are called for a greater destiny. You have a bigger destiny. God has restored something gigantic, something architectonic for your future. So don't refuse it. Don't say no to that invitation. If you accept that invitation, that will be for your own benefit. It has your best interest, you see. So uh, don't neglect it. Start responding to that invitation now, at this moment. So now is the moment of wisdom. May God bless you all.